I'll talk about differentiation, I'm going to give a speech on perception, consciousness, and the future of humanity. I want you to imagine a blank book. And in this book, you can write anything you like. And this book is magic. So that means that whenever you write something on this book, it immediately becomes real. Now this book is not just magic, it's kind of super magic, because you can write things on this book that are inconsistent, illogical, or even class errors. For example, a round square or a high-pitched color. As you ponder that for a second, I'm going to give you a short background about me. Uh, I have both scientific and artistic tendencies, so it was kind of uh, hard to find uh, what I wanted to do uh, for a living. And uh, I come from a family of uh, people that are in the arts, uh, writers, sculptors, uh, you name it. So I've got the crazy gene, and you know, it's hard to satisfy my thirst for novel experience for working in a lab. So eventually I ejected from the corporate structure and began uh, traveling around the world, relocating to a huge number of countries. Uh, here's a notable one, it's called Rarotonga. It's a small island, uh, I should say microscopic, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's 20 square kilometers, uh, there's 8,000 people living on there. I didn't go there on vacation, I relocated there with all my stuff. And by all my stuff, I mean my Hawaiian music CD, my Maori language book, and my Japanese sandals, and so forth. And this is what the place looks like from any angle you care to take a picture from. So it's all like that. It's not a good shot. And this is what my life uh, used to be until I got kind of bored with it. And now I devote most of my time to some uh, really cool brain interface devices that I have in my home. These represent the peak of technology that exists today on the planet. And uh, they're neuro interface technology. They connect directly with my emotional centers. And they can produce a variety of sensations, from love to triumph to melancholy. And uh, unfortunately, they're quite difficult to operate. They're all manually operated. It takes about one to two years each to get them to, to work. I think you may have seen one before. This is what they look like. They're, they're musical instruments. Now, I want you to do a simple experiment. Who's ready for a simple experiment? Any participants? All right, uh, I want you to close your eyes for the next two slides. Don't worry, your wallet is still going to be here. That's a different TED Talk. Uh, yeah, just close your eyes and I'll, I'll awaken you momentarily. So, um, imagine that this is what the world is, will be, and always has been, a world of darkness. Uh, you've, you've been blind from birth, and uh, you remember your last birthday because you remember the voices, you remember what the cake tasted like, but you don't remember what it looked like because you have no understanding of what looking like even means. Now, the problem is worse because not only you are blind, but everybody you know is blind, so no one ever even talked to you about this thing called seeing. Okay, so it's a dark world. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes. I just try to give you a gut feeling for what it means to lack a sensory modality, one that you're accustomed to, namely vision. Uh, not being able to see makes you blind in one respect, uh, with respect to sensory modality called vision. Now, how much would you pay to add one feature, say a color, to this existing modality? Like if I could tell you, you know, you've never seen the color red, but I'm going to sell you the ability to see the color red. How much would that be worth to you? And to make the experiment a little bit more interesting, let's, see, uh, let's say that I can sell you a new color that you've never seen before, okay? It's not on the rainbow. You can't make it in Photoshop. It's new. Now, it turns out my grandma had just such experience, interestingly enough, uh, because she was operated to her eyes for cataract surgery, and they removed the cornea. Uh, and at that time, you, uh, you ultraviolet light was able to penetrate to her retina. And she had what she describes as a novel sensation, now being uh, very interested in consciousness and particular vision. I pushed her quite hard to really make sure that she was telling me the truth, because she was telling me I saw an extra color, a new color, right? And uh, I kind of believe her because she's a painter. And she was able to give me a very good description of what this extra color looked like, because she said, if you give me a palette and a canvas, I do not know which colors I must mix in order to get that color on the canvas for you. I cannot do it, and it's not purple. Okay. So maybe you'll, you'll get to do that when you're old. Now, if a color is just a feature of a modality that you already have, namely vision, then I hope that everyone uh, bid at least uh, uh, $10,000 or the equivalent of three months' salary, uh, in whichever country you're in, for, for the ability to get a new color. So how much would it be worth to you to get a new modality entirely? Uh, that's a hard question to ponder, but imagine, uh, imagine it this way. Let's say your best friend is blind, and he saved up quite a bit of money, 
And other, there's this amazing new surgery uh, that would enable him to see for the first time since he was born. How much would you recommend this friend to invest in this surgery so that he can see? Let's say there's an alternative. He could invest the same money in buying a really cool home. Uh, I think everybody would recommend to a friend to get vision. That's how important uh, senses are to us. They define our interface with the external world and our very sense of existing depends on them. Uh, you can please start an audio file. So that is uh, obviously the famous uh, Tannhauser Overture by Wagner. And that is basically, it's a small packet of information that gets delivered into your cranial cavity and its payload is triumph. It's the ego expanding sense of overcoming a huge difficulty. I mean, probably Napoleon at the height of his European conquests got such a feeling or somebody who defeated a terrible disease. But really all that this feeling of triumph is, is this. This is an information theory uh, and known data. It's so simple that it doesn't even almost exist. It's smaller than a Windows icon. And what, tell, what that tells you is two things. First of all, we're pretty dumb, but also we're pretty lucky because that means that even simple patterns of information have the ability of giving us very valuable and uh, compelling uh, sensations. So we're at the bottom of this experience called uh, feeling. Now, if you compress audio and video, you get a, a bandwidth uh, of about a megabyte per minute for audio and a megabyte per second for video. That's a difference uh, of 60 times. So that means the difference between hearing something and seeing it in full detail is only 60. So I ask myself, what happens if you do times 60 again? So that takes us into the gigabyte range. And uh, let's suppose that you have a mutant, uh, a new human being who has this mutation where he can acquire information from the environment at gigabytes per second. What would they say to you? They would say, well, let's say that we, we have this new uh, sense, it's called excision, and uh, for all purposes, as far as we're concerned, you're exlined because you can't exe. And not being able to exe uh, is kind of bad because you can't ex experience blue phoria or purpleiness or red excitement. You'll never know what these things are, but if I can tell you about my experience, I will tell you that for me to live without excision is like being locked in a tiny box with a little hole staring out at the world. So it makes me feel claustrophobic, really, not to have excision. But then another mutant comes along and they have zeering, and zeering is even cooler because it works at terabytes per second. And so they might say something like, you can't experience Einstein Valdi and your purpleiness is just shallow and insipid. And how do you live like that, right? So where does this all end? Where does this all end? So the difference between a chimp brain and a human brain is about 500 to 1500 cc. That's a difference of about times three, let's say. And that contains your whole human experience. All the things you really like to do, art, compassion, human civilization, uh, the whole of music and the arts. So as we move beyond the human box where I want to take you today, we just start by asking what would it be to be only twice human? To have a brain that's sort of this size, kind of creepy really, but you're still human, right? You're just still a person. And maybe you would be able to appreciate art in multidimensional space. Maybe you could hear symphonies that have so many melodic lines that to any unaugmented human would just feel like a cacophony, like a noise, right? Uh, but for you, they would be so compelling that they would greatly surpass your actual experience of, of what is real life. Uh, and also imagine that there was a connection between two people uh, that is such high resolution, it's all synchronous, uh, it works out so perfectly because of your augmented mental capacities that what humans call true love in uh, poetry and songs is basically just being confined to different prison cells and staring at each other through a hole in the steel wall. So that's twice human, but we move on to Jupiter brains. These are cute little objects that people in the singularity uh, space and the nanotech literature have speculated about because they were trying to get an answer to the question, how powerful, how intelligent can a brain be? But my thing is not that. I don't think that, the, that that's the end all be all of intelligence because intelligence is only valuable if it creates some sort of perception that is valuable for the observer. So uh, I ask myself, how deep can these things feel? What would we be, what would we feel if we were a Jupiter brain? 
And a Jupiter brain, basically, if you check out the first line, that's just meant to communicate to you that whatever they would tell you is complete gibberish, because there's no way in hell you would understand what they're saying to you. But I uh, asked you to do that experiment with me uh, earlier, because now you have a gut sensation of what it feels like to be blind for a minute. And maybe, just maybe, for a Jupiter-sized brain, uh, or for, for a being to become a Jupiter-sized brain through augmentation, uh, through nanotechnological enhancement, would be like it was for you when you opened your eyes again. So I want you to uh, recall that moment. And except that you wouldn't be opening a pair of eyes, you would be opening a trillion of them. But that is still like a monkey uh, standing in front of a monkey audience and saying, well, becoming human would be sort of cool because then we'd have the infinite bananas. And that's not what it's about. And who wants to be a Jupiter brain anyway? So the often asked question is, can I still go to Starbucks? And I mean, um, it's Shenzhen, who, who has a cockroach a pet. All right, some of you may have it and don't know it, but you know, they're, they're pretty, uh, they're not rare around here. And uh, if, it, if it came to you and said to you, you know, I heard about this whole becoming human business, but I'm a cockroach, you know, that's what I do. I go down the drain, up the drain, sometimes I find some food, I kind of like it, I'm satisfied with what I have, I don't want to be a creepy, meat, uh, strange, uh, big uh, head-shaped monster. So, what do you think, what's your take on this whole being human thing? Well, you have to admit, the human condition is not all it's cracked up to be, but it sure as hell beats being a cockroach. I mean, we know which way is up, so definitely you're better off being a Jupiter brain than being just a puny human. Except there's a big difference because you are much more similar to a cockroach than a Jupiter brain would be to you just by orders of magnitude of how bigger the brain and the perception then would be. But now we've talked about content, content of a sense that we already have. Um, it's a whole different ballpark to say, well, imagine the conscious, uh, consciousness is a vessel and you're filling it up with data. You're filling it up with information, with perceptions. They can come in many shapes. It can be auditory or visual, and you can have more or less. You can have higher or lower bandwidth. But I ask myself, we live in a universe where it is possible for you to have this state where the collection of atoms that composes you is conscious. We also know that the same universe is able to support items that do not have that property, such as a chair or a wall. So is it possible that maybe being alive as opposed to dead is just one step in a long ladder? If so, there could exist something called uh, meta-consciousness, and this would be a state that goes far beyond having terabytes uh, of, of data, of information coming to your senses every second. It would be a completely different state according to which we're not just dull and obtuse and kind of myopic, but we're not even alive. So the question is not really do you want to become more aware or not, but do you want to be alive or do you want to stay dead? Now, when we talk about the phenomenal, and that means the senses, the first-person uh, perspective, we have a lot of problems because science is very good at explaining the third-person perspective, but as we have a direct uh, awareness of, uh, the universe is also so, uh, something that exists in the first person. And once you start using science to ask questions about the first person, you get into all kinds of paradoxes, such as could there be zombies that are functionally equivalent to humans? Uh, what is the information content of an orgasm if indeed all perception is based on information? and other problems like that. So in the end, I think we will give up trying to find out how the brain creates consciousness in the same way that we kind of gave up uh, trying to figure out why mass creates gravity. Well, we get the Higgs field nowadays and there's new science going on, but pretty much we gave up on that and we assume that it's fundamental. So we will, in the same way, probably assume that panpsychism is the way the universe works, which means everything is conscious. Consciousness is not something the brain does, it's an intrinsic property of the universe that we live in. Um, and this is empowering because we will be able very shortly within, within 15, 20 years to make small modifications to our neural substrate, our source code as it were, uh, to where you will be able to sit in front of a computer and say, I want to change this mental structure that encodes this feeling of color. Let's see how that changes my perception. You'll save a backup, of course, if you're smart enough, but then you will go and make that change and you will see, oh wow, that's a new color. And you will say, well, that's really amazing. I'm gonna upload it to my Facebook. And then your cousin is gonna download that and say, whoa, 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 mom, come over, check out this new color. And they will give you a like because you invented a new sensory experience which will forever expand the range of what we call being human. Now, there's a suspicious fact that I will uh, leave you with and that is that um, we have two very disturbing uh, things. They're not bad, but they're very suspicious that happen uh, with our life. And the first one is that we uh, feel stuff. So you can think of a functionally equivalent uh, human being to one of us, 
that doesn't have any sensations. But then we do feel something. And the way that we perceive, for example, color is not something that can be explained in the third person. There's a wavelength to it, evidently, but it's completely in a non, so-called non-overlapping magisteria to physics. And so isn't it strange that at the same time we have this weird thing that where we feel, but at the same time we can also talk about it because you see, if uh, the feeling stuff was just an emergent property, was overlapped onto the functioning of our neural substrate, then we wouldn't be able to talk about it. But uh, actually it turns out that we both feel stuff which is strange, and plus we're able to talk about it, which is even more strange. So by Occam's razor, uh, my belief is that we can probably uh, take both things, both weirdnesses, and put them together in one single really weird fact, which is that maybe uh, the brain creates feeling precisely by harboring and nurturing that delusion that you do have the feeling. So it turns out that actually we have no limit at all as far as perception is concerned. So what is the nature of the universe? The nature of the universe, quite likely, is like the book that I talked to you uh, about in the beginning. It's a book where anything can be written, and furthermore, you can write things that are completely nonsensical and that make no sense at all uh, as far as physics is concerned, but they exist nonetheless. You could write red on that book, and red makes no sense to physics, but you still are able to see it. So the ancient uh, Latin saying, cogito ergo sum, which means uh, I think, therefore I am, actually is more properly rephrased to I feel, therefore I am. And I leave you with uh, the fictional character Q's uh, famous words to Captain Picard in Star Trek Next Generation. That is the exploration that awaits you, not mapping stars and studying nebulae, but charting the unknown possibilities of existence. Thank you.